This conference will now be recorded. Well, welcome everybody to our November um, our remote November uh, SAN coordinator meeting. It feels like it's been quite a while since we've been on a coordinator call because we had an in-person coordinator meeting last month in Portland, and we were so glad to see about 65 folks uh, participating in the face-to-face -face coordinator meeting last October. Uh, so since then, some things have happened that we're going to update you on uh, for today's meeting. Um, and so Dan and I are here and we'll, we'll progress on through our um, agenda here. First thing I'd like to make note of, of course, is that next month, the fourth Tuesday of the month actually falls on December 25th. So we would like to have the meeting one week earlier, December 18th. We will send out notice to this effect, but we will have the um, SAN coordinator meeting on December 18th at the same time that we normally do. So it'll just be the second Tuesday and not the third Tuesday. Okay, we have folks saying they aren't hearing. Um, can other folks indicate whether they are hearing me or not? Dan, do you hear me? Okay, uh, Sarah, some I folks you. are telling me. Okay, well. super. Thanks, Dan. Okay, um, some of the folks that can't hear, I'm sorry for that. It does appear to be um, set up okay. Thanks to all of those that have responded in the chat um, about hearing. I appreciate that. Sometimes we do have these glitches, which you will be amused to hear that this is our very last coordinator call on GoToMeeting. So what you'll notice is a different URL next month for the December call. We're gonna be uh, transitioning to Zoom. We're gonna be using Zoom for our uh, coordinator meetings and for our webcasts. So not only have we been testing it out for the last several months on Open Forum, and WCT has decided to move on to, um, to use Zoom. And so, um, and, and I'm seeing in the, in the chat too, if those of you that are not on mute could please take this time to put yourself on mute that would help us as well okay so moving on um we uh, have our um, state of the states we typically start with and while we don't really have um a state issue as such i did want to share with you um some quick work that dan and i provided a quick assessment of some state work um, okay. um many I'm sorry, I'm hearing uh, some background noise. Could you put yourselves on mute, please? Uh, many of you have either participated in a, one of our SAN, uh, our SAN Advanced Topics workshops or been at a state meeting and have heard the update on the 2018 data reporting by NC Sarah. Um, questions have arisen about why data is collected. And um, we noticed that there had been an article written by a state university system about Sarah in general, um, but specifically asserted that the data collected was, um, was a bit more onerous than has been previously seen by state or federal reporting. And so uh, those of us that saw that thought, well, wait a minute, we remember what it was like when we were doing state reporting um, prior to Sarah. So Dan and I did a really quick assessment of states and um, there will be a more thorough assessment available through the guide, which is replacing the SHEO surveys in the next several months. But for purposes of clarifying um, this assertion about the difficulty of reporting, we wanted to, to look at this and, and share a quick overview of reporting. So as I was saying, it, Dan and I did a quick assessment and we concluded that there are approximately 20 states that still require some level of reporting. And some of these are based on um, what type of activity is taking place in the state. Um, so this is outside of SARA. So this is if you were a non sara institution. Um, some of these states would require reporting for any activity and some would only require if you had some kind of experiential learning that's taking place. Place. So it was about 20 that we saw. And a few examples that we wanted to share is, is we were looking at um, the there's, um, let's see, two in the SREB area. Um, one has annual reporting that's in their portal of enrollments by degree field, um, county, race, transfers, degrees granted annually. Another SREB state um, required that um, those that submit registration for online learning are, are able to offer up to 10 placements per site, much like Sarah, but for their renewal each 
each year for their registration, you would have to submit a field placement report where you would list the location of the placement site and the number of placements at each site. And then there was a witchy state that if you are a non um, of this, a non um, member of that state, you would be authorized and you're authorized in that state, you would have to offer um, information about the services leading to leading to um, the resident instruction in Oregon, excuse me, in the state, excuse me, and you would submit to the to that commission annually a detailed listing of, of the students, including personal student information, such as personal identification, demographics, program information in the form that's, di that's directed by that commission. Um, so we just wanted to share this as just kind of a quick understanding of why Sarah requires that there be reporting on an annual basis. As, as we've heard from uh, the NC Sarah folks before, that the the idea of Sarah is a lot of negotiated compromise, and, and very specifically in regard to reporting, as we saw, there were many states that required reporting because the states have a legitimate interest in knowing what's occurring in their states. And so to be able to uh, compromise with what is required previously by states, um, this was developed to provide enrollments by using iPads data and um, also for looking at experiential learning that is occurring in these states um, by the number of students and by the CIP code, the two digit CIP code, um, to be able to know what type of topic area that those um, experiential learnings related to. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of background um, just about what states are still requiring of non sara So it really, as we've discussed for many years, it's the institution's choice if they wanna participate in SARA. Um, and with that comes some responsibilities. And the alternative, of course, is weighing out whether it would be better for the institution to then provide reporting in the variety of states that still require reporting um, and the fees that would be related to that versus um, we're, we're, we're having some background um, noise there. If people could please put themselves on mute. Thank you. Um, so. Uh, I, as I said, that was the state of the states because we really wondered, you know, where are the states now? Because we um, we know that many of our institutions in SAN are a part of SARA, so they may not be aware of what states are still requiring on a non-SARA basis. So just wanted to give you kind of that general outlay of um, what we found in our quick quick assessment of the different states. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Dan to introduce our first um, guest today. Dan? Thanks, Cheryl. Thanks, everybody. Um, Jean Marie Lopez from Virginia Commonwealth University is relatively new to this game, and that, that's good in and of itself to get some new perspectives, but uh, I've gotten to know her a little bit, and so far she has been exceptionally observant and enthusiastic about this work, so we thought she'd be a good person to give us her takes on Portland. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Hi. Um, hi, everyone. As Dan mentioned, I'm Jane Marie Lopez, and I'm the Compliance Administrator at VCU, which is Virginia Commonwealth University. We're located in Central Virginia in the state capital of Richmond. Um, I've been in this role, uh, like, like Dan said, I'm a newbie, so I've been in this role since July of this year, um, and this was my first SAN coordinator meeting and the first time um, that I've attended the WCET conference, um, which was in Portland. So I'm, I've been asked to share a few highlights and some nuggets, if you will, from that conference um, with you today. So I'll start off by chatting about the SAN coordinator meeting, which I found to be obviously one of the most helpful parts of it, of it all. Um, and it took place before the actual conference started, so it was a good opportunity to connect with those of you that were there um, formally sort of in that meeting, but then also at the reception afterwards, which um, was a lot of fun. Um, my background is in programmatic accreditation, so this world of state authorization is a bit different, um, and so I appreciated that opportunity to connect with everyone. Um, and as a new member, I have to say that I received a lot of encouragement, which was nice, and many great suggestions for uh, tackling this new role. 
so during that SAN coordinator meeting, there was some business to attend to. Uh, the Sensational Awards were presented. Um, there was a chat about year eight, uh, but then there were some presentations. So one of the presentations was about institutional disclosures and what might be missing from our institution's websites. Um, my main takeaway from that was um, I had this moment where I was like, oh my goodness, there are a lot of disclosures um, and some that I was not familiar with. So that was a good learning opportunity. Um, and I think this is true for all of us, or at least I well, hope it is. You'll need at to least eat I so these disclosures, thankfully, don't fall on any one person's shoulders. And ultimately, we have to work with others at our institution who are also responsible for these. So during that presentation, uh, Joan, I believe her last name is Bouillon um, from Pearson, she had us go on to, uh, you know, whatever device we had, um, you know, tablet or laptop or phone, and look up, uh, search on our own institution's websites, different types of disclosures, which was an interesting exercise. Um, so one of the, the great suggestions I heard uh, from that presentation was for those who sort of need a starting point, um, it was suggested that you contact your financial aid office since they tend to be responsible for a good number of these. Uh, so again, that collaboration, pretty, uh, collaboration piece really came through. Um, during that presentation. There was also a presentation during that SAN coordinator meeting uh, by Michelle Starkey from Mount St. Mary's in Los Angeles about how they implemented disclosure requirements uh, as a private non-SARA institution. So they discussed their strategy for tackling this. Uh, they showed us the website and the cool updates that they had done. Um, so if you haven't checked them out, their website, I, I'd suggest popping over to take a look at it. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that um, Mount St. Mary's in La Los Angeles is presenting during the webinar tomorrow, I believe, because they are sensational award winners. Um, so nobody told me to plug this, but, you know, it's a good opportunity to hear from them directly. So then moving on to the WCT general sessions, um, I was surprised by the, you know, variety of topics that I saw. So there were sessions on OERs accessibility, student engagement, universal design, um, competency-based education, et cetera. So um, some of those presentations applied directly to my day-to-day -day work, and I would assume the work of many of you. And then others um, were really more of a learning opportunity and um, information that I knew would benefit my colleagues in the department. So I took some good notes and brought that back for them, which they appreciated. Uh, so a few things I'll focus on in this um, are the sessions that discussed accreditation. Um, there was some discussing of the negotiated rulemaking and then research informed practices in distance ed. So the pesky negotiated rulemaking, truly what my, my main takeaway there is what I think we've all heard during these calls and previous webinars, um, and that's to really take advantage of that Frontiers blog um, and the wonderful work from our WCT and SAN folks, um, because they're truly our friend in all of this. Um, there was a discussion about what one of the presenters uh, referred to as the shape shifting of accreditation um, and how there seems to be a greater, uh, you know, newer expectations um, um, from accreditors, which is quite fascinating. And again, being from a working from a or previously working for a programmatic accreditor, I thought that was quite fascinating. Um, and then that other sort of area, that other section um, was about good practices in distance ed by using research. So this uh, was panel style, which um, I quite enjoyed. And during the panel, they were talking about the work being done at Purdue University Global and through the National Research Center for Distance Ed and Technological Advancement, um, also known as DATA. And they're doing quite some interesting work. And I believe over, maybe it was early fall, we received some information from WCET, or maybe it was directly from SAN, about the data-supported studies that were highlighted in that special edition of the online learning journal. Um, and so if you haven't checked that out, I found that to be a great resource and, and something that they discussed quite a bit during that session. Um, if you go, if you just Google DETA data, they're one of the first, um, uh, their website is one of the first ones to pop up and they have information about their ongoing research, presentations that they've done, um, and even information for those who are interested in partnering with them on some of this work. Uh, so they seem to be a wonderful resource uh, for that. And I think essentially overall, I would say what came through for me was, you know, that need to collaborate within our own institution um, and with each other and all the, you know, the resources and the wisdom that we have to share, um, making use of those SAN resources, including that Frontiers blog, um, and then using, you know, the research conducted by our colleagues to support the work that we're doing every day. 
so I personally enjoyed, you know, the meeting and being able to learn from those of you that attended and then from our, you know, our colleagues presenting in the general sessions. And like I said, I brought a lot of information back that I've been using for my day to day work, but also uh, information I shared with my colleagues here. So um, I look forward to attending um, again, hopefully next year. Thank you. That was a fabulous recap. I really appreciate that very much. You gave us some really good takeaways, and uh, that was um, that was so helpful. And I I wanted to look. Uh, I share here in the chat. Um, Russ has put in um, a URL for one of the things that Jean Marie uh, pointed out, as well as um, one of the blogs about um, the negotiated rulemaking. So these these resources that Jean Marie identified, you know, there are some here, as well as um, you may want to communicate with her about some of the other things that that she heard um, and discussed here on this recap. Great recap. I really appreciate it. And also, thank you for the plug for tomorrow's um, webcast. We do have our first webcast about the sensational winners tomorrow about um, licensure programs. So um, you can, if you haven't registered, you still can register. The link is available on the front of the, the homepage of the uh, SAN website. It's uh, on the homepage. You can find the link right there. And um, you can still register for the webcast tomorrow. Thanks, Jean Marie, very much for this really excellent report about Portland. Uh, I think there was a lot to be gained for all of us in Portland. So thanks very much. So moving on to the to the next part of our um, of our agenda today, and I'm glad Jean Marie brought it up because we're talking about where we are with negotiated rulemaking. Uh, since we have all met. Um, there has been some movement in terms of understanding what the department is looking for in terms of committee members and subcommittee members. And there was a time period for the submission of, um, of the nominees to participate in those different committees. And so I'd like to turn this over to Russ Poulin right now to give us an update about where negotiated rulemaking is headed. Russ? Great. Thank you so much, Cheryl. Yes, the... Uh, uh, as you remember, the negotiated rulemaking has uh, a large number of issues that they're going to consider that a lot of them have to do around accreditation, uh, but there's also quite a number that uh, are involved innovations, online education, CBE, and several rules that, that fit around those because uh, there's a lot of concern by uh, departmental uh, leaders and staff that uh, uh, perhaps there are things that can be done to uh, uh, encourage more more innovations and uh, in how students are eligible for for aid and so there's a, a whole lot of things that's going to look at if you want to see a little bit more about what the topics are you can look at that uh, uh, blog post that Cheryl and I put together uh, uh, earlier this year but uh, since that time they did come out with the uh, call for uh, nominations for uh, who's to be uh, a negotiator on that, and they'll, they'll probably have, um, uh, looking around 10 to 12 people uh, plus alternates for each position uh, for the main committee, uh, and, and in that, that there was, uh, they had representatives from different types of institutions, but uh, not very much from from uh, from the innovation side, and so that was sort of sort of interesting. But then they do have a whole subcommittee that has to do with uh, with online education and educational in innovations that will look look at quite a few of these issues and will make recommendations to the main committee. But the main committee will be the one that uh, uh, that makes the makes the decisions. They don't they do not have to accept uh, what the subcommittee uh, puts together if they don't want. And that all of this will take place in uh, January, February, and March of next year. That there's uh, meetings going on in each of those months, so this will all be done and things will start going fast and furious here as we get into the uh, uh, new year with all sorts of things that they're going to um, propose. And we're actually, we're not quite sure what they're going to propose on, on some things, including state authorization that the um, the language around that, the, the talk from the department around that has gone from, it sounded like they were going to completely get rid of the federal state authorization role to now the most recent language sounds more like they just want to uh, update 
the language and then clarify some things around professional licensure. And so that's a, a, a very different tack. And what the department will do is that it's going to come out uh, in January when these uh, committees meet for the first time and that they will present them present the committee members with what the department thinks should be done. And that's typically not how it's been done because the department is one of the negotiators uh, now that they're taking the lead in terms of uh, rather than having talks about what should be in the new rules, that they'll actually put out a plan as to here's what they think it should be. So that'll be interesting. And so we'll see where they go with that. Uh, meanwhile, I've been working a lot with uh, UPSIA and OLC, uh, WCT, UPSIA, and OLC have been going together because uh, we do a lot of work in uh, online education and in educational technologies and uh, felt that it would uh, be uh, stronger if we banded together and had one voice on all these uh, sorts of issues. Uh, we did have a, a joint support letter in terms of we found we found out about several people who were being nominated. We also uh, encouraged some people to get themselves nominated and then put out a su uh, support letter uh, 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 for those people. One of the reasons we did that is that uh, there seems to be a, a big bend towards competency-based education, and it's great to have several slots for competency-based education, but for some of these issues, uh, like regular and substantive interaction and such that uh, if we solve them for competency-based education, we might not solve it for online education or adaptive learning or for any other innovation that you could think of. And so we wanted to make sure that they think about adding some different points of view to those um, those committees. And so that was a, a strong message that we had there as to perhaps expand uh, who's on those committees a bit. Uh, finally, that uh, something that we're doing again with UPSIA and OLC is we're coming uh, up with a, uh, uh, recommendations, uh, policy background statements with recommendations on four different issues. Uh, one is competency-based education and what they might want to do with that. The second is regular and substantive interaction, which greatly affects competency-based education, but as I said before, that it uh, uh, has a, a wider range and we need to figure out uh, what, what to do with that. Uh, there's kind of a catch-all that is aid for the 21st century learner uh, in terms of opening up uh, aid for uh, different types of learner or different uh, having it for um, right now that short-term programs are not eligible, uh, even though somebody could uh, get get aid and then get a job or get aid and then get a, so you know, what can we do uh, to uh, expand uh, aid options, uh, federal financial aid options. And then uh, the final one, which is being written by our friends Cheryl and Dan, is on state authorization. And with that, that we're, we're looking at, we, want, we said that they should recognize reciprocity, uh, we're looking at the lo uh, make recommendations about the uh, location versus residence issue because they had really messed things up by uh, talking about residence so much in the last version that they had, and then also about simplified professional licensure notifications. And so uh, we're working on those right now. Once we have those, we'll definitely share uh, share all of these with you once we uh, feel uh, we have those together. But we're working on a pretty fast. Uh, timeline, and we're making making good progress at this point. With that, Cheryl, is there anything I've forgotten? I don't think so, but I do want to open it up for questions because you know this this is a rather difficult and sticky area that, that we're we're trying to all understand and um, understanding the process since many of us have not seen the negotiated rulemaking process really in action before. So I'm going to open it up and ask if uh, there are any questions of Russ. You can either put it in the chat or put yourself off mute and ask the question if you'd like. Well, Russ, maybe you just are just so clear at this that you explained it beautifully. So I appreciate that. Um, and so just folks, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to be in touch about the process. And you can review the uh, blog that po that. Uh, Russ put the URL for right there, and you can find things on the um, SAN website as well. 
Um, but Russ, I appreciate you being really thorough about how this works and the kind of work that is going on in preparation of these meetings that will start in January. Um, it, Russ, am I correct that we believe that we'll know the members of these committees in December? Uh, yes, they, they said in early December, I think it, I think it is. And so it would be helpful if they uh, let people know by mid-December about whether they're going to uh, need to be in D.C. for all, all these meetings or not. So I uh, think we'll know soon. We'll let you, everyone, know about that. And then also, uh, all the way along the line, whether we're on the committee or not, that we're going to try to influence people on the committee, one, um, on your behalf. Two, we'll keep you updated because uh, we're going to be following it uh, all pretty closely and then keep you updated on what's happening. And then it's, uh, um, and then what happens, too, is that, uh, uh, remember, th a lot of things will get proposed along the way, and maybe somebody else from your campus will hear, oh, I hear they're going to do this. Well, it's... <laughs> Remember, it's all proposals until it's accepted. Uh, so we'll, we'll help you to sort through uh, that as well in case somebody from campus uh, comes down and decide, decides to go in a whole different direction because of uh, something that's proposed versus accepted. So thank you, Cheryl. One last question for you, Russ. Am I correct to say that um, the uh, Negotiated Rulemaking Committee is open to the public but the subcommittees are not open to the public, but they're being live streamed. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah, I see Yolanda's question there. Yes, yeah, that if you uh, uh, want to go, that you can go to the, uh, the full committee out there. And my guess is that, that um, those will be streamed as well. Uh, there was two negotiated role makings earlier this year, and it became a big issue about whether to stream them or not. And so one person, they weren't going to, and then one person sat in the audience and just started streaming it from his phone. <laughs> so, um, oh boy. yeah. Uh, so I think I think then they started started doing it. And so I've not heard anything about that, but you're. Uh, so I wouldn't be surprised that they wouldn't be streamed. Um, but they have, and, and it is odd uh, that they did say that the subcommittees are not open, but they will be streaming it, which will be interesting to see how that works or doesn't work uh, with that, but that would be available. And as those uh, links become available, we'll let you know. Great. And we, and not only we'll let you know, and we'll also be following it so that we can give you um, some kind of summary of what we find uh, from watching those, um, those streamed um, sessions. Thanks very much, Russ. I appreciate that. All the explanation. Um, so, and uh, so moving on to our, our next area, we um, we have, for whatever reason, November seemed to be um, state meeting month. And what we found is that we have some regional groups and we've talked about regional groups in our standing coordinator meetings in the past and, and the benefits of having something regional to be able to address regional issues and to have some kind of interaction between the institutions in your area. Um, there were three different states that met or excuse me, four different states that met in the month of November and three of them are um, SARA based, meaning that they are a collection of the SARA institutions of those states. And then the one that is just a collection of institutions, whether or not they're they're part of SARA. Um, but we have been suggesting that um, that these state meetings are very beneficial and wanted to share with you some of the goings on and what the what the takeaways are. Um, from these meetings. So you can see what these interactions, all of them were face-to-face -face meetings. All three of these groups, well, this one group that we're going to start with, Utah, um, this is their very first meeting, but the other three have had state meetings for some, some time now. So I'm going to start with Sid Grua. Sid, Hi. are you with us on the line today? Hi, Sid. Can you hear me? Yeah, good. <laughs> yeah, you sound Hi. great. Um, so Sid Grua is the state portal entity for Utah and she is with the Utah um, Higher Ed Association. Did I, what's, I'm sorry, did I Utah say that? Utah Higher Education Office of the, there you go. the Board Utah of Regents. The Board of Regents, yeah. Okay, um, thank you for getting the title better. I'm going to turn it over to Sid and let her talk about the structure of the Utah meeting and what the takeaways were for the participants in Utah. Okay. See? Utah is very interesting and I have to point out that I am the state portal agency or agent 
but we have a regulator and that's Department of Commerce Division of Consumer Protection. So we're kind of divided. And um, our office is far less familiar with a lot of the institutions that are NC Sarah, UTS Sarah institutions than commerce is. So one, we appreciated bringing people together because I've actually met people that I've never never met before and I can associate a face with a name. There are 20 institutions in Utah. Um, 19 of those institutions participated in this meeting two weeks ago, Friday. We have Western governors with over 100,000 students, and we have a smattering of institutions when they report their uh, iPads numbers, it's, it's 197 and 402. Uh, FTE. In fact, after the meeting, Cheryl, I will say there is one institution that said they determined that it may not be necessary for them to be a SARA institution. So thank you very much. And I actually don't think they need to, but they wanted to pay their money. Um, we had a one-day meeting. We started early in the morning because if Cheryl and Russ are going to fly in and Dane to speak with our peeps, we want to have a full day. And we ended at four o'clock in the afternoon. Um, for a lot of these institutions, these are entities that don't go to national conferences. They don't go to WCET. They wouldn't go to NASEPs. So we needed to bring this information to them. They don't ask me questions. They don't. I don't get student complaints about them. But they needed to basically have their eyes open to, to what c compliance means. And so we developed an agenda. I work with two or three of my schools, and um, we came up with a draft. And Cheryl and Russ put their two cents on it. And uh, I appreciated the fact that they started our meeting with, I asked for a game show, and they did 20 questions with prizes, um, which was much appreciated. Um, it got kind of broke the ice because, again, my eight institutions know each other in the, eight, in the system. We know Western Governors and BYU, but I didn't know the Rocky Mountain University for Health Professions or the Midwife College or Nightingale College. So so that was a great way to break the ice and get people talking. I think that um, we did, t we touched on professional licensure. Uh, we touched uh, very, very strongly on compliance issues, which Russ and Cheryl and are really totally expert at. And I think we ended the afternoon talking about the idea of building a compliance, um, what was it, the term? Compliance awareness on your campus. Um, the larger your campus, the more likely some department is doing something that you don't know about that really touches on a need to have compliance in another state. They're not aware of it. You're not aware of them. And how do you you know, bring that together down to these teeny tiny schools where one person is doing 17 different things, but they still need to know whom they have to connect with so that they're aware of the fact that when you're doing business in another state, there are rules. Um, uh, I appreciated the fact that Cheryl also went over and showed him the website. It's one thing for me to send out a password and a username and say, here's this resource for you. Um, uh, but to actually have one of the people who is responsible for maintaining that resource walk through it with them and show them where the different resources were, I think was very helpful. I had three people during the meeting, Cheryl, email me and say, what was that password again? <laughs> so, Because they had not remembered what it was. Um, I've got follow-up email from folks. There's no question that they want to meet again, at least once a year. And and we've kind of done this introductory topic that's almost like a 101 workshop that WCET would put on. Um, we've done this for these institutions, and now other questions are going to come up. And we'll, we'll do something perhaps even a little more sophisticated next time. But I think one of the things I got from the follow-up emails from these schools was, we really appreciated the opportunity to get together in the same room to meet each other and 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 to kind of learn from each other. Uh, you know, WGU being as, as 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 huge an institution as it is has more sophisticated practices for building that compliance awareness and for professional licensure notification. And and I would never expect my small Utah schools to be able to follow the WGU footprint, but they can pick ideas and learn from them things that they can apply in their own campuses so they really appreciated coming together and um and i can't wait to do it again next year is that enough of an introduction kiddo that was awesome sid 
Thank you very much. I, I yep. especially appreciate the fact that your institutions uh, enjoy being um, together to learn from each other about things that pertain to your area, especially as you, you shared that um, your oversight agency and your portal entity are not necessarily the same. And so yeah. it, it they they have unique situations to Utah and so they could share in that. So thanks very much for sharing that. That's that's really good to hear. And I'm glad you all had some fun uh, while we did it. That's always helpful, too. Well, um, it this, wouldn't, it, yeah. you guys have got to have Cheryl and Russ come to your states because it wouldn't be the same. Um, Val Fenske actually called and talked to me this morning from Idaho, and and um, we have 20 state institutions. She's got, I think, 10 or nine. And who knows, we might try and do something up in Logan and kind of uh, sister our two states in the future. We don't know. But she wanted to know how it went, and, and she's Good. thinking about doing something there, too. That's super. Great, great. Wonderful. Thanks very, very much, Sid. Welcome. We're going to move on to our Virginia SARA meeting. Uh, they meet, their their um, organization is CHEV, and they met in Richmond. And we have Sandy Delavanti um, today. Sandy, are you on the line? I am. How are you? Hi, Sandy. Sandy was so kind to be able to be on the call with us today. Um, she was at the CHEV meeting, and uh, Dan was able to uh, present at the, San at the uh, SARA meeting for Virginia that day, which I was really glad that he could do. Um, so Sandy's going to share with a little bit about how the Virginia meeting is structured and what the takeaways are uh, for the Virginia meeting. Yes, hi everybody. I'm Sandy Delavante. I'm the Dean of Online Learning at Stratford University. I've been with Stratford for almost two years. Uh, we have a total of about 1,700 online students and this is actually my first um, attendance at a conference and I actually learned quite a bit about uh, compliance placement, policies, um, and the, the conference was structured so that we could actually interact with each other and we actually had opportunities to work as teammates and look at some of the issues uh, facing distance ed. Um, three of the takeaways that I got from the conference, uh, one in particular um, involved uh, international students. So there was a discussion about uh, how to pursue international students and what that involved with compliance issues and policies. And we had a really good discussion about some of those issues. A lot of the issues that we talked about are things that are common to all of us um, who are pursuing international students. And we talked about the importance of contacting embassies, uh, working with the ministries of education, viability plans, resources, operating license, and on and on. And that was information that I hadn't previously um, had in my possession because we talked a lot at my university about um, this particular demographic, but we hadn't really planned and we hadn't really talked about it. We hadn't had any opportunity to have guidance about how to pursue it. So I thought that was really helpful. And additionally helpful was that uh, the SPAN website offers uh, links to about 100 ministries of education, which I think is very helpful. And there's also a little bit of data and information about how to pursue this particular demographic, which I thought was really, really helpful uh, for colleges who are looking at that. Uh, the other thing that I thought was really helpful is we had a discussion about uh, SIPs and SOC codes and uh, what that data entails, and I thought that was really helpful, especially for uh, universities like uh, George Mason University, who shared with us that they do have residential students who take purely online courses and what that means in terms of placement and what that means in terms of data collection. And the last part um, that I got from the conference was uh, it was called an out of state learning activity institutional compliance checklist which came from uh, James Madison University and they were able to share that with us and I thought that was very helpful. I think having a checklist and being able to understand what it entails and what needs to happen at your university, I think that's really helpful. And so those were three of the, the main things that I got from the conference. I had a really uh, good time meeting with some of the other uh, universities. And I think that we have a lot of commonalities and uh, we share a lot of the information uh, that a lot of the information that we received, um, we shared uh, with our colleagues when we returned back to our campuses. And I thought that was very helpful. Thank That's you. That's super, Sandy. Thank you very much for sharing that. Um, 
as as I'm hearing a common theme in Utah and in Virginia um, about the opportunity to talk with others um, about your concerns and, and brainstorming. And, and I heard um, Sandy mentioned te being teammates to be able to work on um, work, work on a different task. So I think that's terrific. Um, so thank you very much, Sandy, for sharing all of that. Um, if anyone has any questions, you know, um, be glad to take those with Sandy. Um, actually, I'm, I'm seeing this. Uh, there was somebody that's asked a question about the compliance checklist, and I think I can answer that. Um, I will contact the um, the person who um, has created this, and uh, this is from James Madison University. They're a Chev member in the state of Virginia, in Harrisonburg, Virginia. It's actually my alma mater. Um, I will um, communicate with the contact at James Madison University about what she's done for a compliance checklist. So be happy to do that. Sandy, thanks so much for taking the time to be on and, and to be able to share with us, you know, what your takeaways were from that meeting. Um, of a few weeks ago. Absolutely. Thank okay. you for having me. Sure. Okay, we're going to move on to the state of Pennsylvania. We have Ron Yoroda. Um, Ron comes to us um, from ACUP, and I'll let him spell out what ACUP stands for. I know I can write it. Um, however, I'll let him talk about it, but it's, it's great to have Ron here. He's the coordinator for one of our larger memberships, and so Pennsylvania meets as a group of SARA institutions, and um, they felt they had a full day as well, and it's their third annual meeting, um, so I'm going to turn it over to Ron. Ron? Thanks, Cheryl. Um, Thanks I for being here. Oh, sure. I am the organization I'm with is called the Association of Independent Colleges and Universities of Pennsylvania. We represent the private nonprofit schools here in, in the state. And um, as Cheryl mentioned, we we also held a, a distance ed SARA workshop this month. It was uh, on November 6th, so it was just three three weeks ago. We had about um, 56 participants, which was which was smaller than previous years because we had some scheduling difficulties. We scheduled it on election day. And then after we scheduled the workshop, several other conferences popped up in the state. But uh, there were, there's about an even split of attendees between staff from public institutions and staff from private nonprofit schools um, and a, a mix of two-year and four-year institutions. As Cheryl mentioned, this was our third statewide uh, distance ed SARA workshop. It began three years ago as the result of discussions on SARA between our State Department of Education and the various higher education sectors in the state. We joined SARA in 2016. So we were one of the last group to join. And there were a lot of questions among college and, colleges and universities doing, doing distance education about this SARA thing. So there were, you know, how is it gonna work? And what are our responsibilities? How much is it gonna cost? So the first workshop was really focused on SARA. It was intended to provide background information on how it worked, um, as well as state and federal regulatory requirements affecting distance ed. Our second workshop in 2017, again, had a, a focus on regu regulatory issues. That one, we emphasized um, presentations relating to distance ed programs leading to professional licensure. That, that's a, a topic that, that was a headache, still is a headache for, for a lot of our, our institutions. This year's workshop, we tried to move away from a focus on regulation and include more sessions on how institutions are doing distance education. So we had a really nice session on how one university uh, set up and operates their distance education program. They talked about how they, they choose courses to, to offer as distance education, how they get faculty involved, and how they try to make the experience for online students, um, how they, they try to make feel, students feel like they belong, both within the classroom and to that, that institution. There was a, another really nice presentation uh, from a school who talked about um, how they tried to work among their, their 14 campuses, so it's by Penn State, to try to collect information on um, out-of-state learning placements, like clinicals and, and student teaching, which is required by, by Sarah for reporting next year. Our, our plan for future years is to 
include some information on SARA and some information on regulatory requirements, but really move more toward having colleges and universities talk about how they're doing things, how they're doing um, distance ed. Um, as, as other folks have mentioned, one of the big selling points of this is being able to get together with folks from other colleges and universities and share, share experiences. Also, it's a great opportunity to have people like Marshall Hill and Cheryl and American, Marion Boki and Russ Pullen come to your state and be in the same room and talk to them. So if you're a state that has not done this, this, this is really a, a nice opportunity to bring together folks from within your state and talk about distance ed. Thanks, Cheryl. Thanks, Ron. That that's great. And and uh, again, I'm hearing this common theme of being able to share um, experiences within your state of how your um, what best practices you are creating at your institution and uh, sharing that out. And so, uh, thanks very much for sharing that, Ron. And so, you all still may be asking, Cheryl, why are you doing this? Um, you know, I think it's. I, I love sharing this common theme that this interaction among institutions is really helpful. Not only if we shared that we should have interactions within our institution, but it's also helpful to have these interactions among other institutions who are doing this kind of work um, to be able to get um, good ideas for how to manage compliance. So thanks very much, Ron, for being on the call today. I really appreciate it. And last but certainly not least, we have the state of Ohio. Ohio is one of the early creators of a group. Uh, they created a group to start meeting in person twice a year um, around 2012, if I'm not mistaken. Jana can correct me. Um, but uh, over the last many years, it's been a, um, a group of institutions from around the state. They've invited border states to attend um, and have had a real good interaction and collaboration among the states to create the agenda and share uh, regional issues. And certainly that was um, even more so back when um, you know people were having to get authorization state by state and there were certain compliance issues that Ohio institutions had to, to manage and with certain other states. And um, so it was very helpful um, to have institutions together. And so today we have uh, Jane Lehman from Sinclair College. And so Jane, are you on the line? I am, hi Cheryl. Hi, there's Jaina. Jaina, I'm so glad you could be on the call today. If you could tell us just a little bit about um, the Ohio meeting um, and maybe how it got structured. I know you were one of the original people who uh, participated in the very first SANO meeting back in, I believe it was spring 2012. Um, and maybe you could talk about how that relationship among the institutions has um, come about. Sure. Well, it was created with the hope we would share best practices and discuss common concerns, and that's exactly what happened. It's been great. Um, we hold this workshop once a year. It's a cooperative effort with four different schools, Sinclair, Franklin University, University of Cincinnati, and The Ohio State University. And we work together to develop and we facilitate the workshop as a team. Um, this year, uh, Friday, November 2nd, we had our all-day SANO workshop at Franklin in Columbus, Ohio. There were about 40 uh, people who attended from all over the state, and we had colleagues from Indiana and North Carolina. So we, anyone's welcome to attend our event. Um, this year it started about eight o'clock. We had our first uh, session was the early bird session for state authorization 101, and that's for folks who are new to state authorization. We're still seeing a few of those trickle in, and they appreciate being uh, um, welcomed with the, just the basics. Then we uh, talked about uh, WCET, and then we, someone recapped that, someone who had attended. And then we went into a, a session on student location tracking. And then the very popular professional licensure disclosure panel discussion. And we had three different schools talk about what they were doing as far as you know, getting the word out about disclosing, disclosing the, the um, licensures and how they reach their students, uh, what they're doing on their web pages, how they're collaborating with colleagues on campus. So that was one of the most popular sessions, I think. Then um, we had lunch, and then Cheryl was there to talk about the federal regulations and give us an update. And I do 
I agree with my colleagues here that it's great to have Cheryl there. And then we had Mary Ann who uh, talked about um, updates with NC Sarah. And that was that was the day. Um, it was a great event, and I would highly recommend any school that's thinking about getting a start in their state to do it. You've got a lot of colleagues that would be glad to help. Is there anything that's else you'd like great, to Jana. talk about, Thanks for sharing. <laughs> No, that was great. It took me, it, it, the unmute takes, you know, yeah. I'm sitting there going, hurry up and unmute. Um, so thank you very much, Jaina, for being able to share that. And uh, yes, we have uh, colleagues in Ohio who have been working on this uh, for, for several years to create something that's new and different each year. And uh, there are many, many institutions in the state of Ohio who keep returning um, for these meetings. So that's the other thing, too, the longevity of it is that, you know, we see in Ohio they've been doing it for five, six years now um, and people still keep coming back. So that's what you're going to see. I anticipate in Pennsylvania. You're going to see that in Utah as well, that people are going to keep wanting to come back to these meetings because they learn from each other, much like when we're able to do our face to face opportunities at NASAPS and um, the same coordinator meetings each each fall. So I'm really glad you all have uh, these four states. Congratulations for your good work. Um, you've been an inspiration, it looks like, to uh, Nevada. Um, Leanne shared with us that they're going to have their first meeting. And so um, we appreciate the leadership that you states have, have taken um, to show us the benefits of some regional interactions, as well as being part of SAN. So thanks very much, everyone, for giving your takeaways. Um, I hope that you all have benefited uh, from hearing some of the specifics that were takeaways from these meetings, and we'll find out more of what we can offer. Uh, um, thank you also for the additional uh, note in the chat um, about the James Madison University checklist. I will be getting in touch with Sarah and see what we can do to offer that as well. Are there any questions about state networking groups? Um, we've had actual sessions on this before. Um, please know that we are supportive in helping you uh, coordinate um, state in-person meetings if you would like uh, assistance from us as well. So thank you all for, you know, that was Jana, Ron, Sid, and Sandy um, for being on the call to share that today. Okay, so just uh, last few things uh, on our call today. Um, the SAN Basics Workshop registration is open. Uh, many of you coordinators are beyond the basics. I understand that. And um, however, you may have some at your institution that are new to this work. It doesn't have to be the compliance person. Sometimes we have had members from legal counsel. We've had instructional designers, faculty, and folks from the provost's office attend our SAN Basics workshop because their work touches upon the compliance requirements for state authorization. So we would encourage them to attend. It's going to be held in Arlington, Virginia. Arlington, Virginia is the Washington, D.C. metro area. We are literally across the river from Georgetown, where we will be staying. Um, we're staying at a hotel that is um, about three tenths of a mile from the location that we're having um, the workshop. Um, UVA is the location. UVA has a um, a Roslyn, Virginia location, um, and so we'll be we'll be there and using the um, Keybridge Marriott. You can find the registration uh, on the SAN website. The and here's a surprise. The um, code, the membership password code, is it depends. All caps, no spaces. It depends. If you want to share that with your folks for the SAN membership rate. Again, the password is it depends. It's one word, all caps. Uh, then um, I, I do hope that you all will save the date. We've talked about the importance of face-to-face -face interactions and the NASAPS annual conference has been a favorite by many for several years now. NASAPS has generously offered us the opportunity to participate in the creation of the agenda which means that regulators and institutions are learning together at the general and um, concurrent sessions. We will have a SAN half day meeting. Um, last year it started with a breakfast. It's probably going to be the way it is again this year. So we'll have a half day where we can address specific um, state authorization institution focused sessions. But I am aware of at least four or five of our SAN members who have submitted um, proposals for the NASAPS uh, conference. So I'm looking forward to uh, coordinating the agenda with the NASAPS folks and um, and we'll be able to probably put out that conference agenda by um, mid-January. I believe that was the timeline last year. It's going to be held in Jacksonville, Florida. 
And something else that I wanted to share with you all is the benefit of using our open forum. Open forum is a service we began last spring um, to test it out. We're using Zoom. The link is there. Um, it will always be that Zoom room if you want to um, bookmark it. But the second Tuesday of each month, we will have um, an opportunity for anyone at a SAN institution. So it's not just coordinators. It can be anybody at your institution can link in. And it's 30 minutes to ask questions about a specific topic. So we've done a variety of topics. We did um, data accessibility. We did uh, cybersecurity and data protection. We've done negotiated rulemaking. We've done the delay. Um, and coming up, we're going to do borrower's defense to repayment, the litigation, and the current status of the regulation. We thought that it would be um, very important to see where that has come um, because it, it's following a similar path that we've seen with the state authorization regulations. So we have, we're very fortunate to have one of our friends from Hogan Levels. Her name is Michelle Tellock. She's a senior associate at Hogan Levels. We'll be on the call to answer your questions questions. That's December 11th. It's the second Tuesday of December. And I really encourage you uh, to take those 30 minutes to jump on that call and listen to the questions that others may ask um, and also questions that you develop uh, to be able to share with those experts. So as you see, we have a few upcoming events. You'll be receiving um, notice from us in about a week because next week's the first week of December. Can't believe that. Um, so the first week of December, you'll see the tentative agenda come out. We will have the new location for our SAN coordinator meetings because we will not be using um, GoToMeeting anymore. We'll be moving to Zoom, and hopefully that will be very easy for all of us uh, to move to Zoom. And um, the next SAN webcast will likely be in January because we're talking about the uh, second group of folks to share about their Sensational Awards. So again, I want to promote the Sensational Awards webcast that's tomorrow. We have our friends from the University of Phoenix and our friends from um, Mount St. Mary's University presenting about licensure programs. I think it'll be a very enlightening session. And so that will be tomorrow. Um, and you can still register for it on the home page of the STAN website. Okay, before we go, are there any questions um, for any, from anybody? Dan, can you think of anything that we've missed? Uh, I mean, no. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. No, not really. I mean, <laughs> Sorry I'm, to put you on the you spot. <laughs> but it's no, always no, good to have I, Dan. It's all good. Thank you. Okay, well, everybody, thank you so much. Thank you to our speakers today, Jean Marie, Russ, um, Jaina, Ron, Sid, and Sandy. Uh, really appreciate your additional information. And thanks, Dan, for your support in uh, putting on these uh, coordinator calls. So have a, have a great day, everybody. And we'll talk to you again, remember, on December 18th, the third Tuesday of December. So take care, everybody. Have a great day. Bye-bye.